A very warm welcome to our Conversations in Craft session. This is our um, wonderful series of talks that um, is running alongside uh, as, and as part of the Artifact Exhibition. Um, we Just a little bit of housekeeping, if I could ask everybody to turn their uh, phones off, that would be great because we're recording the session. Well, we have got a most amazing panel for you today. Um, so get ready to hear from some amazing craft makers and curators, Celia Pym, Jay Marriott, Alice Kettle, Jay Mystery. And chairing the session is Grant Gibson. He's actually curated this series, uh, and you might know him from his brilliant podcast, Material Matters. Let's give them a very, very warm welcome. Thank you, Becky. That was a warm welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Nice to see you this morning. Thanks very much for coming. Um, yeah, we have an excellent panel to talk about um, a talk I was keen to program, really on the basis of, I was trying to work out on the train on the way up whether it's an antidote or a riposte to some of the work downstairs or the, the thinking behind the show, but it's neither of that, really. It's, it's a conversation with, with the work that's downstairs where, where you, to show that craft is really about more than just people who are brilliant at manipulating materials or create beautiful things. We're keen to talk about the people who are making craft that has something to say and that are kind of addressing the state that we're in and the moment of complete flux that the world appears to be in, not appears to be in, is in. Um, I'm keen to find out, hello, I'm keen to find out a little bit about you, if I may, before we start, because it's always good to know who we're talking to. Um, can I have a show of hands? This is also about muscle memory, by the way, because the format of this is I'm going to talk, we're going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes. There's going to be five or maybe 10, if you're feeling loquacious, minutes of questions. So it's kind of like getting you used to that motion. <laughs> um, uh, so in the first instance, we get to know, do we have artists, makers in the audience? You, you don't look entirely <laughs> certain. Oh, <laughs> no, no, you're, you're, you're eventually, eventually. Uh, that's good to know. Um, designers? Oh, well, okay. Yeah, you multitask, that's fine. Um, any media? No, you can say what the devil you like. That's, that's reassuring. And um, I, sorry, and the guys at the back who've heard me say this every day, twice a day for the last three days, is when I did this years ago, actually at a show called Lost in Lace, I don't know if you were there, I, 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 I did this thing where we had a huge audience and there was lots of raised hands and I went through this big list of who everybody could possibly be and then at the end, these two uh, women came up to me, furious they were, and they said, when you did that list, you didn't mention curators. So as a result of that, <laughs> whenever I do this, I always ask, any curators in the room? And you see, that's why I didn't do it the first time. <laughs> anyway, um, nice to see you all. Now we know who we're talking to, sort of. Uh, my notion is, I think, that we're gonna, I'm going to allow everybody to briefly introduce themselves. Then we're going to get into a, a bit of a chat. I'll pull some threads together. Um, and fundamentally, then, at the end, it's your time to ask these people the questions, that, the things that you want to know. So maybe in the first instance, um, if I start with my, on my right, um, Jane, do you want to just introduce yourself to the crowd? Yes. <clears throat> so morning, I'm Jane Marriott. I'm director of Howard House Trust, which is a charity that runs a beautiful 18th century house seven miles north of Leeds city centre. I have a confession to make, first and foremost, that we are, I'm here today particularly to talk about the Howard Biennial, but the house and the charity never had any intention of creating a biennial. What we wanted to do with this beautiful 18th century house, an incredible collection of paintings going from the early Renaissance through to El Greco, all the way through to um, uh, portraits by Gainsborough, Turner, up and to Epstein, was also to pick up the craftsmanship in the house. And we've got beautiful Chippendale in there. It's the largest commission in the country. We've got beautiful um, decorative arts, ceilings by Robert Adams. So we wanted to do a show about craft, and we wanted to engage our audience in craft and the conversations around craft. But what became very clear, particularly up here, in Yorkshire and with the audience we had is that this was a conversation that really captured people's imagination. And so this house has become so much more than a historic house. It has become a place 
to have conversations about urgent issues of our time, which I know we're going to talk about, that really was able to be a stage to engage a much broader audience in starting to think about how, what the impact is, what difference they could make as well. I spent 20 years in galleries, so Tate, Royal Academy of Arts, Hepworth, Wakefield. Going to a historic house was really interesting because you have a much broader audience. You have people who are coming just to have a lovely walk, people who are coming to see the incredible collection. And it became very clear to me that we could have a much wider impact with a greater audience through the exhibitions we do there. So over the past five years, we've built up shows, including the Howard Biennial. And the first one was called Useful, Beautiful, Why Craft Matters, curated <coughs> by Hugo MacDonald. And it really started to address craft not as a object or indeed process, but a way of living and what craft could mean and could start to have an emotional impact on our audience. That was incredibly well received. We decided we were going to do another, that it would become a biennial, and we were meant to do it, of course, in 2021. Because of COVID, because of everything that was happening, it was delayed this year, but I'm really glad it was delayed because what enabled all of us, and Hugo as the curator, was to create this show on, with that backdrop of a global pandemic, Black Lives Matters, and of course even now, the ongoing war in Ukraine. So uh, this year we have an exhibition called Radical Acts, Why Craft Matters. I've left a few if anyone wants to have a look afterwards. And we invited 16 makers to come and work in the house and to respond to that question of what is your radical act. Hugo, if he was here, would say that radical, or the, the kind of um, root of that word, is all about going back to your roots. And that, in a way, by looking back, we could start to look to the future. And it isn't about being nostalgic, but starting to bring conversations. So we've got beautiful 18th century floor. You'll see some of the makers shown here. The lovely Celia Pym is one of the makers in the show. And what we asked all of them to do both in the house and across 140 acres of grounds and gardens, was to talk in their own words about the work they're doing and some of the many issues that we're grappling with today. Um, I won't say any more because I know everyone has to introduce themselves, but just to say, when I arrived, we were getting about 160,000 visitors a year. <clears throat> we're now up to a quarter of a million in five years. And I was just saying to Celia, a busy day used to be about 1,500 people. Since we've opened the exhibition only a few weeks ago, we're averaging about 2,300 people. And the response is incredible. So it clearly feels the right time to do something The power like of craft. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about the power of craft. Jay. OK. Uh, um, so my name's Jay Mystery. Um, I'm a potter and a researcher. Um, and so in my academic work, um, I, I look at issues to do with conservation, biodiversity conservation, um, forest management, um, mostly in the Amazon basin. Um, and I work a lot with indigenous groups in that region. Um, as you might know, or you might not know, um, indigenous peoples, um, they manage about a quarter of the Earth's land surface in terms of owning or managing our biodiversity and the forests that maintain our climate or try to maintain our climate. So their knowledge is really, really important for everybody, and, you know, for themselves, but also for us as well. Um, but they have, um, they don't really have, get to have much of a voice in terms of how the environment is managed. They're pretty marginalized, obviously. They've had centuries of colonization and various other types of violence inflicted on them. Um, and so one of, the, one of the bits of work that I do is trying to bring indigenous voices to decision making around conservation and forest management in that region. Um, and it's kind of like building, you know, taking different types of knowledge systems. So I'm trained as a scientist and have lots, we have lots of scientific knowledge about how the Amazon works, for example, but indigenous people also have their own traditional knowledge about how things work. And it's about bringing those two types of knowledge to the table on an even playing field. Um, and yeah, having conversations around that. So my kind of uh, academic work focuses on that, but as a potter, so I've been potting um, 
since I was about 18. Um, but I actually, originally, I'm of Indian heritage, Gujarati heritage, and I come from the caste of potters. So my heritage is Kumbar, which is caste of potters. Um, and my name is Jay Mystery. Mystery is actually, they, over time, different groups, they change their name. And so my name, Mystery, is actually called, is a skilled artisan. So it's kind of like a wider grouping of people. So my grandfathers, for example, are carpenters or were carpenters. Um, so they kind of changed their skill, their art, artisan, um, to something slightly different. But a lot of my relatives are still potters. I'm intrigued. So did you feel you had no choice? You had to, what, you yeah. had to work with clay? No. It was your destiny. <laughs> well, the thing is, I suppose when I've when, as a child, I went to India quite a few times mm. with my parents, and I saw my relatives. I mean, my parents were, never did any kind of craft, or uh, neither carpentry nor uh, potting, but my other relatives, they were all potters, and I used to see that when I used mm. to go there. I suppose it's kind of something that kind of like by osmosis, <laughs> kind mm. of like I kind of, you know, kind of absorbed, but I never really thought about it until I suddenly, I don't know, once I, when I was about 18, I thought, oh, let me go and do an evening class. And then I was hooked, basically. Mm. Um, and so since then, I've been, I've been doing that. And then obviously, when I've gone back, I've seen my relatives and the potters as well. So, I'm just, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I am going to let you eat those <laughs> shoes. <yourself. laughs> I just want to concentrate on this for a moment. So uh, was there a moment where um, you, you realise that maybe the ceramic work was not just going to be something that you, you did as a pastime or, or as, uh, even professionally, but you were going to combine these interests and your activism within within. Yeah, clay. yeah. So I suppose in <clears throat> 2016, which isn't actually that long ago, um, but in 2016, I became a professor. So I don't know if you know anything about academia, but, you know, you join as a lecturer and then you make your way up, you know, in academia. And in 2016, I became a professor. And I, at that point, I just thought to myself, well, actually, I can probably, um, I don't need to work full time. Mm. I can actually work a little bit less and dedicate a bit more time to pottery, which I've always done, but never had enough time in my life to do it. And so, yeah, I went down part time. I did a HNC at Richmond Art School, which was just an amazing experience because as someone who's trained as a scientist, my brain works in a certain way. And when I started doing that course, it was just like, what is this? What's a sketchbook? What's this? You know, I just couldn't compute, you know, because I was so used to writing academic journals and, and being very critical and just, you know, very analytic and stuff like that. So it was a brilliant kind of learning experience. Mm. And I, I think it's at that point that I would kind of say that I became what I like to call myself a serious potter, you know. So moving away from that kind of just kind of potting around in my kitchen or in the studio with one of my friends to actually doing something which is a bit more you know, um, I don't know, aligned with the, the, the work that I do in my mm. academic work. And mm. so I kind of started through that HNC bringing those two bits of work together. And then in 2018, uh, 2019, I got a Crafting Futures grant, which I'm going to talk about yes. a little bit later. Yes. Um, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, from one professor, God, I feel <laughs> underqualified. <laughs> Just my BA. Um, don't know what I've been doing with my time. To another. Alice, do yeah. feel free to introduce yourself. Well, yes. Um, well, I'm really delighted to be here, and Jay and Jane and Celia and Grant, thank you very much. And what it's so interesting hearing, you know, how you're talking about these your your, your own practices and your experience, because a lot of it, it echoes with me that I work in academia, so um, and I work in Man in Manchester. Um, I've been a practitioner, um, an artist. And I trained as a fine artist originally, so it's quite interesting that I have kind of found material practice kind of slightly later in life, you know, perhaps sooner that in, in my career than maybe you, Jay. But I discovered that there was something about materiality and processes of making that, that, that evoked something about human experience that was absolutely critical and, and important. And it engages with issues, engages about being in the world in a really special way. And I suppose that's what I've done. So I'm, I work in stitch textiles. And, there, and I suppose what it's done is it's enabled me to explore my own sort of notion of my own place in the world. But beyond that, through my academic role, kind of see how that uh, communicates with others and how we share that process collectively. So more recently, I have been um, working with marginalized communities because I started to question, well, what is the purpose of this practice? How does it, how does it, um, 
how is it a, lang a common language that makes us come together as a world community? How do we um, draw lessons from each other and how do we create understanding and kind of meet and reciprocity through this, these processes of making rather than it being self-examinatory mm. in, in the way? And, and so it's about opening up practice and learning and then feeding that back in in various different ways. And also understanding that I'm in a very privileged position that we all are. And there's a way that we can actually encounter and challenge some of these kind of assumptions about hierarchies, about marginalization. Um, and Stitch has always been a, a, a feminist practice, hasn't it? But I think there's ways that we can kind of open that up and take it you know, beyond um, these, these kind of categorizations. Mm. So obviously, you know, I'm working with young people in my academic role who are <coughs> um, demanding that we, um, we face our future challenges about sustainability, about equality, about diversity. And that's where I think we have to kind of position our practice as central and use it to make, to not make any assumptions, but to um, question how we do things and how we take it forward. And then I also support a lot of my staff and, and advocate for how material practices in the world and how making processes are essential at a time in education when they are being starved and challenged and marginalized. Ooh. So I, I think there, there are many, many um, stories that we have to tell with our yeah, with yeah. Our we could be here for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Becky, who, which she gets really upset if I ever run. So, okay. so, I, so I'm going to... Yeah. Celia, you've sat there very patiently. Um, do tell the audience all about yourself. Okay, great. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. And it's great to be on this panel with such a fantastic group of women and Grant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm an artist. I'm a, I work pr predominantly with textiles. It's really important to me that I hand make. I sort of realised the other day, I said it out loud somewhere, I meet the world through my hands. They're really important and significant to me and my understanding of people and things. Um, I primarily, for the last 15, 16 years, I've been exploring ideas around mending and damage and repair in textiles, which is uh, what I did with Harewood House, um, a project with 16 members of their team, staff, extended staff, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a while, but the thing I'd like to say about mending, um, just to put it into the, this conversation, is my interest began because I'd inherited a jumper that was very profoundly damaged just after someone had died, my uncle. And the thing that piqued my curiosity is the feeling that damage, particularly in clothing, is this trace of a person. And the evocative quality of materials to give a sense of a body and uh, inhabited life in a body. And then the second thing about this garment was there was already repair on it. And I have consistently in the last, um, the, the work I've been doing, been moved by that feeling of care you can show to someone by, by extension of caring for their things. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in quiet care I should say, I mean, I wasn't going to talk about it, but I was thinking about it. Everyone's talking about their sort of the diversity of their practice and their careers through academia and making. I, I was so interested in care, I actually trained to be a nurse and then promptly stopped being a nurse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I was interested in this, how do you communicate a care for someone in an unshowy way? And how do you communicate it on a regular basis? that it's something that can be sustained. And then by extension, perhaps you extend that to the planet or the, you know, I'm interested in small acts that build up to a bigger one. Did you, I mean, you, you're in the, the show. The, yes. The, uh, in James. <clears throat> when you started darning. Yes. Did you think this is a radical act? So when I started <clears throat> darning, I mean, mending's really captivated fashion's attention at the moment. Hasn't it? And it's everywhere. But when I started, it was really personal. So I don't think I thought of it as a radical act mm. at all. I noticed these stitches made by an aunt of mine who had died 12 years earlier. I mean, I'm interested to hear Jay talk about 
observing family members being potters because my family is a big family of makers and I don't think I understood until much later in my life how significant watching people make within my home was mm. and making in a they just did it like I didn't even understand that they were just doing it and so to see her <coughs> stitches I was just I think I was looking for some I just wanted to imitate her I mean mm. it was really as simple as mm. that like I the best way I can explain it is she spent a lot of my childhood looking after me. I looked at these stitches and I thought, I remember that feeling. She used to come pick me up from school and buy me, f you know, I'm looking at stitches, but I was thinking of all these experiences I'd had with her. It was very surprising that this, this material thing could be so evocative. Mm. And so I just thought, hmm, she knew something. Maybe I'll go to the library and look up how to darn. And that was really the beginning of it. It wasn't, I mean, perhaps it's radical to try and remember people that you love. <laughs> but that was really where the origin was. And it, it's only later that I've sort of thought of it. I think for me, the radical bit is that it's, it's not very fast <laughs> and mm -hmm. that it takes time and that encouraging people to slow down actually is quite an important thing to do and is potentially radical in a technologically uh, driven yeah, world yeah. Mm -hmm. and that then encourages reflection on relationships and you know mm. other things i mean we have what we have here is we have two shows radical acts at harwood house jay you're in the show gaining ground at the cross council I'm going to, these are plugs. <laughs> Alice, you're kind, of, you're kind of independent, but you have this fabulous book that you gave me just before we, we walked in, um, which we're going to talk about as well. But it, it maybe in the first instance, we talk um, a little bit about the Harwood House show. Um, and as you said, this is the second edition. The first was Useful Beautiful, which was a William Morris, based on a William Morris quote, who, as we know, was a kind of prototype socialist who ended up selling... Uh, his work rather expensively to, to wealthy people. Um, but I'm interested, was the notion second time round, obviously the world had changed yes. um, quite significantly through, through all sorts of different events. I mean, was the first about seeding the notion that you could, you could do craft, contemporary craft, in a space like this? And for addition two, did you then feel you had something to say? I mean, you also had something to say, I guess, about the history of the house. Yes. We had Chris Day here last year talking about his work and obviously he did a project before right. Radical Acts that responded to the history of the house and so can we address yes. the, the house's history and, and how that affected your thinking behind the show? <clears throat> yes I mean the the house is fundamental to the show and what I mean by that is I've worked in beautiful galleries which in a sense are a stage set for whatever you want to exhibit. Howard House for those of you um, that don't know the history was built on the wealth garnered from the transatlantic slave trade. The Lassells family, the Earl and Countess of Hareward, their ancestors, made significant money out there, both as owners of plantations, customs, a whole variety of uh, different business ventures. That in itself is an incredibly difficult history that we have talked about openly now for over 25 years. But it's not enough, of course, just to talk about that. What we need to do is to be able to use this space, use this incredible house and grounds to actually think about how we can make a difference. And for me, the house in itself, all these incredible country houses, particularly around uh, England and, and actually the UK, all of us should question, well, why bother keeping them? And we keep them because we need to think about what they can do today. And because there is such a personal, um, difficult story for Hareward, in some ways it's in the best position to then be able to launch a biennial, which doesn't just talk about one particular issue, but mm. a whole variety. But I guess, I guess the, the piece of work that most directly addresses the issue is, is a... Um, Matt Collins, uh, Matt Collins yes. with the table that yes. he's done. And maybe we yes. can talk a little bit about the thinking behind that yeah. and, and yeah. why yeah. and where it's positioned yeah. and why. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so you're right. When we when we started planning the second uh, biennial or the iteration of it, we were looking very much at kind of climate crisis, and actually I see Sebastian's works on there, which uh, I can touch on later. But it became very clear with that uh, backdrop of COVID, Black Lives Matters, war in Europe, that actually the exhibition needed to address many more fundamental issues. And we invited Matt Collins. In fact, all, all of the exhibitors came up to see Harewood, to spend time at Harewood, and asked them to think about what they would like to show, how they would like to respond to the history of the house. Mac came up and had a very emotional experience. He uh, is um, mixed heritage. He, a lot of his family came from Jamaica. And <coughs> he started to realize as he walked around the house that actually the Lassell's family could well have owned some of his family in the past. And not surprisingly, he had a very emotional response to that. And he went away and started to think about what he wanted to do in the house. And he um, came back and wanted to propose a work called Open Code, which is essentially a dominoes table with a domino set on it, made out black, that he wanted to put in one of the drawing rooms. The drawing rooms, of course, from kind of 18th century was where the gentlemen and ladies would retire and play games after dinner. He wanted to slightly turn that on its head and bring his own family's heritage of playing dominoes into that space on a very stark, very beautiful, but very plainly designed black table, which contrasts really starkly with the ornateness of the room and the Chippendale furniture mm. as well. The placement of it was also equally important. So it's placed right under the portrait of Edwin Lassells, who's the one who built the house with this money that he had made in the West Indies. And so what's so brilliant and thoughtful about Mac's work is that it's not wanting to put people on the defensive, but to, this is the piece actually you just see there, that's the portrait. There it is, as if by magic, that's like Mr. It, ben. Yes. What he wants to, to do is bring people to encourage them to come and play dominoes under this portrait and to start to engage in the history of the house, in his own history, his family's history. And of course, as we start to engage, that then gen engenders, we hope, an empathy. And if we engender an empathy and understanding, we can then make a difference. Mm. So Mac's work is, is a really powerful one. Mm. I mean, just sticking with, with that show for a while, I mean, Celie, as we've discussed, you're obviously involved in it. Mm. Be quite interested to know when the curator, Hugo MacDonald, came to you with the notion of being in the show, mm. what your response was and, and, and what you ended up doing. Well, the... I always think it's quite interesting to hear about the process in which shows come together mm. because for this show it was, I can't remember the year, was it 2020 I think? And uh, Ma uh, Hugo, <coughs> not Mac, Hugo said, I'm doing this show, I'm interested in you being participating, You're, we're asking you to make a response to the house and the estate, come make a visit. So it was a very open invitation to start with, and I'm always quite excited by those. You know, the title Radical Acts was already in the works, but it was pretty light touch in mm. terms of the invitation. Just come, mm. take a look, have a response, write up a, rep a proposal for what you might be interested in making or doing. It's also really, I mean, I don't know if this is worth mentioning in this context, because there aren't that many makers, but... There was no mention of budget either. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say that is really, uh, it's not a knock to you. It's like, so. <laughs> no, no, no. But what I mean is that you don't, you are a bit more speculative in your thinking when you go. If you're not constrained by the budget straight off, it's like, okay, if what Hugo is like, if not unlimited funds, but what's your response just un just wide open. So I came, I had a really great day, and the th but the thing that hit me when I went and made my initial visit was, at one point, I'd been shown the state floor, there's so much to take in. Mm. It's a magnificent <clears throat> house, it's huge, it's exciting, it's a bit overwhelming. Um, and then um, I said, oh, can I have a look at the attic? 
And some three women took me up to the attic and it was like my idea of heaven. Boxes of stuff, <laughs> dusty, all the, the ceiling was a bit lower. And the, but the women who were showing me around were just a lot of fun mm. and I really hit it off with them. And I, I mean, my proposal changed over time, but what stayed with me was meeting them and being, getting a sort of look behind the scenes of the house. So then the proposal evolved out of that. Slightly forgotten what your question was. Well, what was your <laughs> Sorry, right. Grant. Wasn't that interesting? <laughs> no, it was. What, what was the end result? What did you Oh, end so up the end doing? result. So the end that. result, yeah. So then, <laughs> then, but it was a long back and forth. So six months later, eight months later, we agreed on the proposal, which was that I would, I just wanted to meet, I was interested in the people who took care of the house and I would make an offer to them and the estate and looking care in the broadest sense of the word running things making hair would happen and i would invite them to bring me something in need of repair right and my feeling about that invitation which i've made a lot is that it's a lot easier to talk to someone if you're talking through an object if you meet someone and just say oh hello i'm celia nice to meet you who are you <laughs> it's much harder to talk whereas if i say oh I, that top is what happened to your sweater or you it's interesting how talking through an object is a there's a lot of practical conversation that then opens up space for perhaps more emotional conversation or more narrative conversation and so the piece is 16 mended items accompanied by photographs there it is mm -hmm. um accompanied by photographs of the owner with their mended things some of them are wearing them some not and an, a written account of how they would just what the object means to them and it's called the mending library because it sits in the old library mm. which it's, is yeah it's very delightful it's thank very you delightful. grant i enjoyed seeing it jay yes let's <laughs> talk about um and i know you're not the curator but you have a you've made a contribution to this show Gaining Ground, which is yep. at the, uh, the relatively new gallery at the Crafts Council. I mean, can you just give us a quick overview of the exhibition, but also kind of more importantly, how your project fits into it? Yeah, so um, the exhibition, it kind of brings together <coughs> a group of um, people. They're like makers, artists, some of them are researchers as well, um, that all received a Crafting Futures grant from the British Council. Um, and the Crafting Futures Grant, if you don't know about it, look it up, um, gives you a small amount of money to kind of develop a project with um, a community or with a, a group of makers in, in other countries. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the exhibition brings together a number of these projects from the past couple of years to kind of exhibit the kind of work that they did with those collaborations. And I suppose I was thinking about what was a common thread in you know looking at all the different um, projects, and I think the, the probably the most important thing in my perspective anyway um, is this idea of ethical engagement and how you actually approach working with people in other places, um, in other landscapes, um, and that idea of yeah that kind of what is the way that you how do you work with people? How do and, you? And, because because there is this thing where you're parachuted in, <laughs> Correct. it seems to me quite often yeah. something that used to be the case. So, so how, how do you navigate that relationship? Yeah, so I suppose in, in my particular project, mm. if I can talk about that, I yeah, suppose, yeah, um, it's, it kind of came about with this long-term um, partnership that I've had with people in, in Guyana. And so it's one of the countries that I've worked about 20 years, um, working with these indigenous communities, the Makushi and Wapishana ethnicities. Um, and kind of working with them for a long time and building this relationship and trust over them. So I, so I suppose when I'm thinking about um, how do you work with people, I think building relationships and building this trust, I think is really important. Um, and I think that's one of the things that kind of comes out from mm. the exhibition as well in, in the other projects <clears throat> as well. Um, so yeah, so I suppose I have worked with these people for a long time. Um, through my academic work and then it just happened that when I started thinking about pottery more seriously uh -huh. um, it's um, there was this opportunity where I met this group of potters who had done pottery for a long time in the past but a lot of people you know a lot of pottery has been replaced as worldwide with you know met, uh, aluminiums and pots and various other things and plastic and whatnot and but they wanted to revive this pottery basically mm. they wanted to get it back running again and are working in a particular community where there's a, a locally run um 
social enterprise that is about artisans. In fact, I've got the T-shirt. It's called Wabani. Uh, life is handmade. Um, and <laughs> I work with this particular group um, because it's made up of like weavers, um, hammock makers, furniture makers. So there's a, lots of little artisan little groups around there. And then I was working specifically with the potters to try to get the pottery kind of working again. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that was my collaboration, really. And what happens to the pots? They're, they're sold on the, on the market? Where, where, what happens? So I suppose we really kind of starting from scratch because they weren't really selling anything or doing anything with the pottery. Yeah. They were really just kind of doing a little bit of here and there kind of stuff. And I think one of the, one of the things that I'm, I feel that is really important that came out of the work that I did with them was <clears throat> to kind of, I suppose, bring that kind of pride back into the use of these objects. And I think it's what people were saying before about the everyday use of craft. You know, in indigenous communities, craft is, is not something that you look at or, you know, display or anything like that. Everybody uses it in mm. everyday mm. craft, in everyday activities. So, for example, Basketry is really, really important in terms of like the way you farm. You farm with basketry objects. Uh, you collect stuff with basketry objects. You fish, you hunt with things that are made or craft, what we would term craft objects. Um, and so their everyday lives and, you know, that sustain them. It, they're using craft all the time, basically. But pottery was something that had not had disappeared and that's what they wanted to kind of bring back. Yeah. So I, just to finish, one of the no, things no, that okay. was really, really, um, was really nice was that one of the things that we worked together on uh, was bringing back these cooking pots. So everybody used to cook in clay pots, but that's kind of disappeared. But everybody remembers cooking in clay pots and there, some people still had some, but they were quite rare. And so when we started working again with cooking pots, Everybody in the village wanted a cooking pot, basically. Mm. So we got the orders in for cooking pots. So actually, it was more than kind of necessarily selling at this point, even though it is about developing an economic livelihood for them uh, going forward. It was more about bringing back practices and objects that were used in the past as something like, you know, every day, everybody would start having these again, basically. Mm. And so that was the really nice thing, that we were in the studio or the kind of outside studio that they had, and people would come and visit us, and they'd put their orders on for, the, for these cooking pots, basically, because they all wanted one. And this one said, oh, I remember my granny having one of those, and I really want one of those, so <laughs> can I have that one, you know? So I think that was, for me, that's, that's been one of the really nice outcomes. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of bringing back the pride you know, in making and using these objects because that's been a little bit lost as well. Yeah, that's no, interesting what you say because, I mean, craft as a word has almost been defined in opposition to... Because before the Industrial Revolution, it, it wasn't craft, it was just how you made stuff to yeah. use, right? Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting. I mean, Jay, I'm intrigued by what you do. You, you're bringing communities together. And, and Alice, this has become a, an important thread. Mm. You see what I'm doing yeah. there? Yeah. Good. Thread. Good. <laughs> yeah. I'm not very well, but I can still do that. Uh, important thread of your work. I mean, can, yeah. we, can we just kind of trace the evolution of, of how you started working with cool. different communities to create yeah. the, the work that you're doing? Could I very briefly, mm. before I do that, say that actually we have a project in the same exhibition oh, as Jay, which is um, with colleagues of mine, where we've worked um, with uh, the Cordillera region of the Philippines. And exactly what you're saying, it's about uh, the way of life, sustaining the way of life, the whole kind of ecology and so kind of social dynamics of the communities. But it's, they have lost... It's an oral tradition that is in danger of being lost. Mm -hmm. And so the whole disruption of that, that economy starts to kind of be a, a problem. So, the, so it's exactly about the ethics, which I agree is completely kind of central to this. So we, we have, my colleagues primarily, have, gone, have, have, have collaborated in saying, how do we capture that knowledge so <clears throat> that you can pass it down through mm -hmm. generations and it becomes sustainable? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting. But to come back to your mm. thread, um, I start, well, I have three daughters, and you know how, how children are, they kind of challenge your <laughs> sort of everyday um, you know, attitude to life. And so I was, um, one of my daughters said to me, I'm not going to do art because it's very about the self and it's very egocentric and I'm never going to be able to earn any money. And of course, she's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and she and she has she's um, very interested in human rights and social justice, mm. as am I. 
And I think there's something about craft that has a democracy mm -hmm. and making and artists, mm -hmm. you know, artists, you know, they can kind of transgress the norm. They can see things differently and imagine, you know, different kind of futures. And I started to think, actually, what am I doing in terms of my own practice? It, it needs to kind of reach out into the world and kind of create change. And you can do that in quiet ways, as exactly as Celia says. And so I um, decided I couldn't actually go forward unless I acknowledge this. As a, um, and also, all of us, you know, you meet such extraordinary people, and it's very humbling in terms of... And textiles is a way, is, is something that is, is practiced all over the world in very different ways. It has very specific knowledges, but it also has a commonality. And not only that, it, it kind of maps the trades, trade routes, and all of those kind of really problematic colonialist, post-colonialist histories, the mm. slave trade, etc. Mm. And because I'm working in Manchester, we have this constant um, cottonopolis history that kind of underpins our, our kind of urban identity. So, and we've seen this seismic shift in terms of how we think about society, how we think about social justice, and how we think about our sustainable futures. And I just thought, I have to engage with this. And um, that's much more complicated than you anticipate. You go into it in all in innocence. And so I've worked, and I, it, I started working with refugees and this whole, whole idea about migration, how textiles has migrated. It's kind of underpinned the economy and prosperity of Manchester and many of our, mm -hmm. many of our industries in, um, in the UK. And that's about people. It's about kind of a demographic. It's about knowledge. It's about um, the way we, we, we have created the Commonwealth. So I felt that I had to address the, 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 uh, the movement of people, pe um, the people displacement, which kind of proliferated in the 2014-15 up post um, the... Um, you know, there was that period of time where conflict, you know, the Arab conflict, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And so I had to frame, put a proposal in, put frame a project, which then um, I had to kind of find ways of delivering. And what I felt was fundamental to it was the ethics. The, it wasn't my lived experience, but I had to hold it together. And it had to be something that kind of elevated humanity, um, all of those people who don't have a voice it had to portray them as of significance and of value, which meant that it had to have a certain aesthetic and a, ha, had to have within it a certain level of skill and presentation because I didn't want to diminish all of these people I was meeting. So those kind of parameters meant it had certain ways that it was going to be configured. But of course, in terms of contact with all these thousands of people that I was meeting that had to be very adept and very um, open to negotiation as a kind of constant. And I still continue to do that. Um, and it's, it's made me examine myself and my own motivations and my own sense of privilege and the, my own place in the world. And it also has made me think this has to be sustainable. I ha it has to constantly be, in, be recycled and kind of represented as something that supports, continues to support and goes forward. So I don't just drop in. Mm. Um, and that you can't presume anything about that. You have to kind of be open to anything and everything. So do, does that kind it of does. Answer? It does. We're running out of time. And I know we're running out of time because this monitor in front of me is telling me I have three minutes and 30 seconds. Um, I'm very keen if there are any questions from the floor. We did the raising hands thing earlier, so you're well versed. Um, does anybody have any questions that they want to, to pose to the panel? Are you sure? <laughs> so generally, I go into the crowd with a mic and I force somebody, <laughs> but, but I'm not doing that because I've got Becky running around. Okay, well, then if nobody's got any questions and you're absolutely convinced you don't have any questions, I'm sure the panel will be hanging about for a little bit afterwards. I'm inclined, therefore, to, to wrap it up. I mean, I, I, it's a bit frustrating because I think we could have talked for at least another three quarters of an hour, <laughs> but we don't have that privilege, unfortunately. So in that case, I'm going to say, 
Thank you very much to Jane, to Jay, to Alice and Celia. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Just adding our thanks. Gosh, what a thoughtful session. Uh, thank you for sharing your incredible wisdom uh, and your wise words. There was, I was making lots of notes, and I know that lots of people in the audience were also doing that. Talking through an object, um, it brings engagement, doesn't it? Um, whether it's community or whether it's through an indiv individual, it engenders empathy and understanding. And as Jane said, it can make a difference. Uh, Grant, you're right. We could have been here um, for the entire, for the entire another three hours. So much to talk about, so much to think about. Thank you um, so much, uh, Jane and Jay and Celia and Alice, and of course, Grant for leading the session so beautifully. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you.